Thank you, Vanda. Well, it's a pleasure to be part of this webinar today. Um, and I'm here to share the perspective of faith-based, socially responsible investors. What I hope to cover is first give a brief introduction of Friends Fiduciary, so you know who's speaking to you. Situate divestment in the larger framework of socially responsible investing. Share some of uh, the ways that religious investors approach their screening. Talk briefly about common roadblocks to divestment, some of the arguments you might have heard against divestment from an investor perspective. And then also um, share about shareholder engagement as a strategy for change. First off, just very briefly, as Vonda mentioned, I'm the executive director of Friends Fiduciary. We're a faith-based Quaker, socially responsible investment company based in Philadelphia. We manage about a half billion for over 400 organizations across the US. We don't invest through mutual funds, uh, ETFs or hedge funds, because we need to be able to screen out the companies, uh, be able to screen the companies we invest in. And finally, while today I'm speaking from our particular experience at Friends Fiduciary, what we do is representative of many other active, faith-based, socially responsible investors. There are three main ways that investors have reflected their values in the stewardship of their financial assets. We've heard about direct impact investing. Um, uh, Suzanne touched on that a bit. Um, and divestment from TEAS. My focus will be on ways that some religious investors are going beyond divestment through both negative and positive screening and through what we call shareholder engagement. TEAS did a great job of covering divestment uh, philosophically uh, and practically. Um, from a religious investor perspective, there's only one aspect of negative screening that I would highlight. Um, and Tees touched on this, it's important, uh, what becomes important in divestment are definitions. Um, how is one defining the issue uh, that one is taking a divestment position on? And one consideration is whether to divest from only direct producers or to also uh, exclude key suppliers to those producers. This is what I call rigor, uh, and that rigor in the definition can vary across institutions and investment managers. And I think, in, in my opinion at least, investors, religious investors, tend to take a more holistic approach than perhaps some other investors uh, when defining uh, their parameters for divestment. So for example, Quakers, my own faith community, is one of the peace churches. So we believe in nonviolence. It's one of our core beliefs. So accordingly, we screen out all companies producing weapons and weapons components, conventional as well as nuclear. And we actually strive for zero tolerance. So it doesn't matter what percentage of a company's revenue comes from weapons productions or producing components, we will still screen them out. Um, that rigor is relatively uncommon among secular investors uh, who uh, might exclude companies producing the weapons, but often will use a threshold for that screening. So anything less than 5% of revenue is okay from a screening perspective uh, for some investors. And religious investors often take a different approach. Loud. Now I'd like to move on to positive screening used by socially responsible investors. Many faith-based investors and other socially responsible investors actively screen into their portfolios companies that are deemed to be better actors or those with better ESG records. And ESG stands for environmental, social, and governance issues. This data is available from a variety of independent rating agencies. And while the data is less than perfect, it does allow for comparisons across companies and is a tool that investors can use to focus on 
what are called the better actors in, in a particular sector. The UN principles on responsible investing encourages investors to allocate capital to companies with more sustainable business practices, products, and services. Um, and the UN SDGs or sustainable development goals are an example of framework is an example of a framework that groups could use to approach positive screening in their portfolios. Another positive screening approach is targeted to a particular concern, and I'll use the example of climate change. At Friends Fiduciary, we work with a number of NGO partners, RAN, Ceres, and others, that provide research and data on banks and insurance companies that finance and insure fossil fuel company operations. Excuse me, let me go back. Initially, this began in 2011 uh, with an effort focused on banks that were financing mountaintop removal coal producers. We actually got several of the banks to pull that financing and now this has broadened more generally to banks supporting fossil fuel companies. Rainforest Action Network, or RAN, produces an annual report uh, called Banking on Climate Change that lists uh, the largest financiers of fossil fuel companies. And there's a, a group uh, called Unfriend Coal, which has a campaign targeting insurers uh, that has really started to gain traction. Um, and now investors are even focusing on reinsurers, some of the more progressive of which are European companies. So while I've excited, uh, cited examples of screening based on climate risk, uh, like many other faith-based investors at Friends Fiduciary, our positive screening also looks at issues like labor practices, human rights, supply chains, um, and other social issues. And this is where a framework like the Sustainable Development Goals can be helpful. So as an investor, I wanted to just talk very briefly about some of the roadblocks that folks hear uh, when they advocate for divestment. Um, first off, often uh, many institutional investors don't want or believe they should think in a values-based framework. This includes pension funds and mutual funds. Um, they say they're obligated to achieve maximum uh, uh, financial return. Um, frankly, I don't find this particularly on issues like nuclear destruction and climate change, where these are not relative values, but they're existential threats to all. And there's a clear business case uh, for uh, avoiding those types of investments because ultimately that existential threat threatens all businesses as well. One of the other common, def uh, common roadblocks is diversification. Um, as Thies mentioned, um, there are only like 27 companies identified as nuclear weapons producers. They make up only 2% of the S&P 500. Um, and so that's from a diversification perspective, that's not particularly material. While fossil fuels are a larger component, um, this weighting has declined along with the decline in oil prices. And some may have seen the headlines, oil is now at a negative price per barrel uh, for futures contracts. Um, right now, oil and gas is about 4% of the S&P. Just as a comparison, back in 2013, it comprised 11%. So the diversification argument is declining there as well. Uh, returns, I'm only going to say one thing about returns. Um, uh, you don't have to give up return, period, to invest consistent with your values. Um, and you have to do nothing more than look at our website and see that we've been able to meet or beat the market with our rigorous screening, and others have been as well. Final roadblock is what uh, is often cited as implementation. Oh, we can't do it because here's the way our investment management works, or here are the managers we're using. Um, actually, this argument is, is really disingenuous. 
um, investment managers will follow their clients' directions uh, and figure out a way to get it done. Um, ultimately, in a portfolio where there's a will, there's a way, and there are models out there. Uh, so this is, is a particularly weak uh, roadblock, in my view, from an investment perspective. The last thing I want to touch on is shareholder engagement. Um, whatever you're screening in or out, uh, religious investors also believe an important piece of being a responsible investor is active ownership. Um, ultimately, because even for groups like Friends Fiduciary, which screen in carefully companies, um, all publicly traded companies have things so that they could improve on. We want to be responsible owners of the companies we hold, and we also want to see them be sustainable and successful over the long term. As Tees mentioned, the theory is that companies that are treating their customers uh, fairly, uh, that are engaging in good practices, are uh, treating their employees fairly, are going to be more successful over the long term and thereby increase shareholder value. First off, I need to say you could do a whole webinar on shareholder engagement, but I'm just going to touch very briefly on it in the interest of time. Um, first off, this work is nearly always done in, in partnership with other investors. Um, and Vanda mentioned uh, that I'm on the board of ICCR, uh, which is an international faith-based socially responsible uh, investment coalition with over 300 investors representing uh, half a trillion dollars in assets under management. Uh, the tools used in shareholder engagement are voting shareholder proxies, talking directly with companies in dialogues, uh, filing shareholder resolutions as shareholders, and also policy advocacy. I'm going to focus primarily on company dialogues. And this is where, as an investor, we can reach out and do reach out to talk directly with companies when we have questions or concerns about their practices and policies. And when we reach out to companies, we do this uh, in partnership with other like-minded investors who have the same concern that we do. Uh, when companies are unresponsive or if they refuse to talk to us as shareholders, we have the ability to file shareholder resolutions. Uh, these resolutions then go on the company proxy. We get to state why we think the company could be doing better. Um, and the company typically hates to have shareholder resolutions on their proxy. So sometimes filing a resolution will get a company to engage on an issue when they've been um, unwilling to do so otherwise. Those resolutions then are voted on by all shareholders um, on the investor proxy. The last piece here is what uh, we're calling policy advocacy. Uh, you don't often find businesses uh, advocating for regulation, but investors are business people. Um, and we will advocate for policies and regulations when we believe it's in the long-term sustainable interest of, uh, of society and even of businesses. One that Friends Fiduciary has worked uh, for a number of years on is fugitive methane emission regulation. Um, we have been active in that um, over the years. So to draw this to a close, I hope I've given you some look into how religious investors reflect on their values. Um, the takeaways I have or are number one, um, even with divesting and applying rigorous screens, you can meet or beat capital market returns. It's possible to maintain a diversified portfolio, which reduces investment risk, um, even with rigorous screening. Um, it's important to invest consistent with your organizational values. And by socially responsible investing, we're supporting positive change in the world. The last uh, page of my presentation and my understanding is these will be available um, afterwards uh, are some of our partners and links uh, 
uh, to uh, partners that I've mentioned in this uh, presentation. Thank you very much.